Welcome to the Story Fulfilled Podcast, where we deep dive into how each character and story in the Bible comes together to fulfill the story of God. I'm Fletcher. I'm Abby. And I'm Jay. And today's story is about the Judaizers. The Judaizers. Who that? That's guys. what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about who they were. One of the things, though, about these Judaizers, oh, no. they're very well known for being all about the snip snip circumcision. Oh, my. Just like Fletcher <laughs> from the last week. For, hey, <laughs> listen to last week's episode. Don't <laughs> take that out of context. Is it last week or the week before? I this don't, was last, last week. week. Last yeah. week. And this is uh, Fletcher would be a Judaizer. Right. And right. <laughs> when we were thinking about our question, we thought that we don't want to talk about that this week. So oh, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? That's it. What's, what's the favorite? question? Oh. That's the question. What's your favorite color? I like that. Just because, yeah. Yeah, I have two depending on my mood. <laughs> if I'm in like a good mood, then I really like yellow. And if I'm in like a normal mood, I like blue. Huh. Which is weird because it's like if you were sad, you'd like blue. And then yeah. It's, so it's opposite. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Did you say sad for yellow? Is no, I said I like it when I'm in a cheery mood. Oh. Depend- I'm those just, are like oh, my two so favorite you're normally colors, sad and then together. cheery mood no, well, yellow. I like blue and yellow together. Really, the Swedish flag is oh. one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Oh. Or like I see somebody on the ski hill. With a blue coat and yellow snow pants, or the oh, yeah. other one. Oof, it's very stylish. Yeah, <laughs> Sweden. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. You're yeah. S- That's how I base my favorite color picks. <laughs> picks by <laughs> flags. By flags. By fl- no, no, by flags. By ski hills and oh, by cars usually. <laughs> cars. Go. Yeah. No, not by cars. There's there's a weird trend with car colors where it's like this muted, weird. It's hard to explain, but. No idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Like modern I'm, colors are all modern lame. Modern colors are all lame yeah. on cars. Bring back the 70s it's like, like a purple creamy, funk. creamy, muted. So you pick a color and then make it kind of creamy and muted a bit. And that's what they I'm are. I'm glad and beige just, is out. Beige was in for yeah. a long time and it, it's just the ugliest color. I'm glad they I'll brought back more that. like silvers and, and metallic colors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, so we're way off topic, but when, <laughs> like, when like the Nissan Murano first came out, they had this like the toasted orange color, which what? looked really good. Toasted orange? Yeah, it was nice. Like burnt orange? It was, yeah, like a burnt orange, okay. like a brown, reddish or orangish brown, but it was really <laughs> nice. I liked it. Well, that actually comes into one of my favorite colors is okay. this color. I'm showing Jay a picture. Abby <laughs> might post it, but it's the color that the Focus ST came in. It's like a yellowy orange, and it is beautiful. Look at that. Okay. Oh my. It's a nice yellow. It, it's like a mustardy. It's golden. almost no, but it's yellow. dark. It's, it's a little dark. I was gonna say it's almost like Bumblebee, the Transformer, but it's a mm-hmm. little bit mm-hmm. a little darker and yeah. a little richer. Yeah. We'll we'll post a picture so you can F- see. Focus ST what yellow. That's my colors. favorite. There we go. Uh, I don't really have a favorite color, if I'm honest. Dude, I, you I've have never to pick even one. thought of it. I just it's pink, isn't it? No, if I have to pick one, then it's blue because it's the Leafs. Any oh, like man. a dark blue then, or like a medium like blue? The Toronto Maple Leafs blue. Mm. Oh, like not it. baby blue like your shirt? No. Mm. Yeah. But He's I don't wearing a really, baby blue shirt. I don't think I of colors him. really where I'm like, oh, I need that, or <laughs> or I can't wear it. There's there aren't very many colors that I'm like, oh, I can't wear. What that doesn't either. go well with like your skin tone? Yeah. Like I can't are wear you, that yellow shirt. Are you it's, an autumn or are you a spring? Mm, are or you a cold winter? or warm colors? <laughs> it, you're asking me like. like I, For example, what, I what look good in What season do I blues. prefer or have I been <laughs> no, given assigned geez. a season no, or something? It's based on your skin tones and the undertones in your skin, if they're more warm or if they're... I'm white. I look, <laughs> I look good in have, cooler colors. We'll put like it that way. You have a pinkish tone too, though, okay. to your skin, which Fletcher and I both do as well. So, so then maybe know. the compliments are blue. There we go. Maybe. Yeah. We don't know anything it, about fashion or I don't. skin tone. Look at me. <laughs> I was going to say, I have a pair of ripped pants on and a Under Armour hoodie. And not in the cool way ripped. <laughs> no, not purposefully ripped. Accidentally. I have perfect fashion for a podcast. <laughs> yeah, we have the face for radio. Face for radio. There we go. All right. <laughs> Let's focus back up here. Yeah. We would love to hear what your favorite color is. And nothing about circumcision. And nothing about mail, circumcision. Please. So yeah. if you want to let us know your favorite color, you can do so. 
if you want to write a whole email about it, you can. If you want to send us a picture of the shade, that's there you even go. better. Story at bfmc.org or hit us up on our social media. Mm-hmm. And, of course, as always, we do encourage you to read the story for yourselves to get the whole picture of what is going on. And today's story takes place in both the book of Acts as well as in Galatians. I like those books. Yeah. All right. What's happening? Well, since last <laughs> week, Jesus has died. Well, not not like last week oh. in our time, but oh, last week's time. episode. In podcast time. In podcast time. Jesus has died. He's also resurrected and gone on to found the church by giving the the disciples the Holy Spirit, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the early church leaders were made mostly of Jesus' apostles. But there's another leader named Paul who was converted after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul, he travels around in the Roman world, spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. And we read that Paul went on his first missionary journey before today's story. Um, It probably lasted from 47 to 48 AD, and it included Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. And he started in Antioch, went to Cyprus, Perga, Antioch, in Sidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. <laughs> Did you say Antioch twice? I guess there's two of them, which there is. Yeah. One, in, right. one in Syria and one in Syria. That's yeah. right. That'll confuse me. And yeah. that'll confuse everybody else. And it did confuse me. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's good to know that the second one is somewhere else. Um, but then in, in Derby, Paul and Barnabas were driven out or what in, in several eight, different ones, yeah. different areas that they went to, uh, they were driven out by jealous Jewish le- religious leaders. And so then they returned home to Antioch of Syria and today's story takes place before and after this, this first journey. Right. So we actually have two stories today. One of them mm-hmm. that takes place basically directly before, right. and one of them takes place directly after. Mm-hmm. Well, that's usually how stories go. There's a first part and a second part and a third We're part. Skipping the middle. <laughs> We're skipping, We're skipping the, middle. the middle. We're at Paul's missionary journey. We're just talking about the before and after situation. But yeah, like we said, uh, there's two stories. One of them is called The Incident at Antioch, and that probably happened around 44 AD uh, when Peter visits Antioch, mm-hmm. and that's Antioch of Syria, not the other one. Uh, And then the second story is about the Jerusalem Council, which probably took place around 50 AD in Jerusalem, as the title suggests. Right. Uh, And then speaking of Paul, his conversion to Christianity probably happened about 34 BC, and then he died around 64 to 68 under Emperor Nero. So he's been teaching a long time, and we're right smack dab in the middle of his ministry uh, to the Gentiles. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to confuse you even further about Antioch. <laughs> oh, great. So, yes, we know the story is in Jerusalem, but Antioch of Syria is not actually in modern-day Syria. Right. So even though we're going to call it <laughs> oh, Antioch of Syria, it's actually in modern-day Turkey, which is, it, and it's on a city called Antakya, right. which is actually, it's only 12 kilometers from the border of Syria and Turkey. So it's pretty close, but it's Antioch of Syria is actually in modern-day Turkey. With a similar sounding name. With a similar and, and sounding Takia. name. Yeah, which makes sense, but they probably just adapted Like translated yeah. it a few times and it got weird. Yeah. This is our <laughs> city Google now, Trans- we're changing. <laughs> yeah, they Google translated it. <laughs> and that's what came out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. So, speaking of Judaizers, the word was kind of basically made up in English, but it's based on this Greek word. Um, and it's only used once in the New Testament. And I can't tell you what it is because I can't speak Greek, but we (laughs) chose it as a word to describe those who enforce Judaism on Christians. And that is the whole situation of what's going on in these two stories. So let's get into it. In in particular, circumcision. Right. So... Which we didn't want to talk about. We we didn't want to talk about... Stop circumcision. Look, I filtered every (laughs) circumcision. No, I'm just joking. We might message it, mention it a few times throughout this episode. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Galatians 2.14 is where our story takes place, and it's the incident at Antioch, and Peter is visiting the city uh, of Antioch, and we hear that he starts off, you know, living with the Gentiles, with the Christians there, uh, and he's getting along fine. He's eating with them, he's fellowshipping with them, he's mm-hmm. teaching them. Again, Peter was called to be a missionary to the Gentiles at one point, so he has no problems eating with them or, or living with them in any way. 
Uh, and one time, a group called the Judaizers, who is sent by James, the brother of Jesus, from Jerusalem. Right. And basically, they come preaching this message that if you want to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised. If you want to be a Christian. They have to follow the, the Jewish customs. If you want Don't to be a Christian, oh, you got to get circumcised. But and now, to be, to be clear as well, they, they weren't. <laughs> they wouldn't actually have been saying to be a Christian because that wasn't even a term. Oh, right, yes. Uh, it was if you want to be saved, be saved if you want to follow Jesus, who is the fulfillment of Jewish mm-hmm. prophecy and, and the fulfillment of the law, um, then you need, to be, you need to be circumcised, which would fall in line with um, any... Uh, in Jewish law, if anyone wanted to become a Jew, they would have to be circumcised. Mm-hmm. And so they're kind of right in saying that because they're following in line with that. But what they're wrestling with here, and we'll talk a bit more mm-hmm. about this, is the freedom that we have in Christ and the the freedom from the law because it's not the law that saves us. Right. So. They're really fighting for the the new distinction between what what is the distinction between Christianity and Judaism? That's right. something that we're discovering in today's. If you like what you're hearing, we would love if you rated and subscribed to us on whatever platform you're listening to. It really helps us to get out to more audience viewers. Thanks for listening. Judaizers come and say, "Look, if you want to be saved, you have to be circumcised. That is part of the part of the system. That's mandatory." Yeah. Um, and what ends up happening is. Peter separates himself from the Gentile Christians who aren't circumcised, and right. he stops eating with them, he stops fellowshipping with them, um, and really just separates himself from the Jew- Gentile Christians because of the influence of these Jewish uh, Judaizers saying, look, you need to circumcise the Gentiles. Right. And eventually, Paul gets there and finds out about Peter kind of switching sides, and he really just goes and calls him out in front of everybody and says, Peter, you're being a hypocrite. Why are you acting like a Gentile around Gentiles? And then when Jews come around, you're forcing everybody yeah. to be Jewish. What are you doing? This is wrong. And Paul tells Peter that as Jews, we should know this. We know that the law isn't what saves us, but right. it's faith in Jesus that saves us instead. So why should we insist that Jews follow the same, sorry, that Gentiles follow the same rules as Jews do? Right. So they have this whole situation, and eventually Peter comes to realize this, which leads us into the second uh, story is found in Acts 15, and that's at the Council of Jerusalem. So this is after um, Paul's first missionary journey. He's come back uh, to Antioch, and it basically starts Paul and Barnabas hear about these teachers again, talking about how you need to be saved, sorry, need to be circumcised to be saved, Mm. and Paul and Barnabas have already argued with lots of different people. They go around having debates uh, and basically condemning these people, saying, no, this is not the gospel that is meant to be preached. And and all the while, a great number of Gentiles becoming Christians as well. So they're they're presented with this problem that they need to figure out a solution to. What do we do with these Gentile believers? Mm -hmm. Paul has just come back from this missionary journey to all Gentiles, basically, um, around the Roman Empire. And so... These Judaizers are coming up and saying, look, you've just converted all these Gentiles. Let's get circumcising. Right, right, Paul's, right. you know, he's trying to caution that. So Paul finds these teachers and they start having debates and arguments about what's going on. And eventually, uh, Paul and Barnabas, it says they're appointed to go to Jerusalem to the other apostles and leaders. And they want to bring up the question of, do you need to be circumcised mm. to be saved? And what that looks like. So on their way down, so Antioch is a little bit further north. They go south. They pass through uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, and they talk to churches there and about how uh, God has led them and and used them to to grow the church through the Gentiles. Uh, Eventually, they get to Jerusalem, and they are met by all the the Jerusalem leaders there. So you're thinking Peter, you're thinking James, you're thinking all the leaders of the church and all the other elders. Um, And again, Paul and Barnabas talk about what they've accomplished in um, the Roman world, They're converting Gentiles all around. Yep. Uh, and then eventually they're kind of interrupted by these Pharisees who show up and say, well, you're, you're circumcising, right? Isn't it necessary to be circumcised to be saved? And that starts a whole other debate and discussion about what's yep. going on. Eventually a council is formed and an official discussion takes place on what is necessary to be saved and is circumcision part of that? 
So we're going to pull up actually Acts 15 chapter, sorry, Acts chapter 15, verse 7 to 11. And that's going to basically tell us the conclusion that that council formed. Yeah. So it reads, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. Right. And it says right after Peter finished speaking, um, the room fell silent. Yeah. And then it also says that Paul and Bara- Barabbas, <laughs> Barnabas uh, started telling them about their exploits throughout the Roman Empire, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and all that God had done uh, for them and through them. And then the, the last conclusion made in the Jerusalem Council is by James, yeah. who we know had been talking about this uh, circumcision problem a lot. He was the one kind of sending people out to It was to important Judaism. to him and yeah. his, his friends. He was a major proponent of it anyway. Um, but he kind of sent, settles on this idea that here are some rules that we're going to put out that aren't necessary for salvation, but will be encouraged to Christians to, uh, to support unity in the churches between the Gentiles and the Jews, because we know there was conflict going around, should they follow the law or not. And basically what they settled on is that Christians should abstain from things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and uh, drained from blood, which is basically eating kosher meat uh, the way Jews do. And again, that's an emphasis. Those are rules that they put in place to encourage unity between Jews and Gentiles, not to make it as... Uh, necess- necessary for salvation, mm-hmm. and that's the end of the Council of Jerusalem. Let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about those. What's going on there? Why the heck is it in the Bible? Well, it's important because it's really the founding of uh, the church and their first disagreement and coming to uh, agreement on what Christianity looks like. We we kind of talked about and touched on the idea of what's Judaism versus what's Christianity and how are they different, right? Um, and this is the first discussion they really had as a whole church talking about an important issue in the church. And that is circumcision and the necessity of uh, faith in Christ as opposed to following the law. And then we see that councils are actually what the church relies on for the next couple hundred years uh, for really big decision-making. We know there's the the council of of Nicaea and the council of, you know, Constantinople. There's dozens of them, but right. That's how the church made big, important decisions. They're called ecumenical. Right. I don't know if I pronounced that right. But yep. ecumenical councils uh, throughout the next couple hundred years that really decided what Christianity is compared to other religions and compared to Judaism. Right. And, yeah, the, the idea that the church as a whole gets together uh, to decide what Christianity is and what God's word is mm-hmm. and is so it- important. In that, too, I think a very important statement that Peter makes is um, he talks about this being a yoke that neither their fathers nor them have been able to bear, Mm -hmm. which is which is the law. Um, And so what what they're uncovering really is the heart of the gospel in that we can't please God. There is no human possible way for us to please God by following the law. It's, it's just not attainable. What's left for us then is to have faith in Jesus that he actually can please God and live that life in and through us. And so then, then it does become, okay, we actually can please God in the way that we live as we submit our lives to Mm -hmm. him and to his authority. And so what we kind of tease out of that is that, It's not about the rules. It's not about the outward actions as far as living the life that we're called to live. Uh, It's it's simply about aligning ourselves with what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through us in the way that he is leading us and submitting ourselves to that. 
Um, and, and Jesus, I think, summarizes that quite succinctly when he says, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the whole of what we are called to uh, as we live out our Christian faith. And now, so we can take that and say, so it's not about the rules. It's not about like people have the the grace to, to mess up and to get things wrong. And that's true, but there's also a caveat there because some people will take that as a license and say, don't judge me. Uh, I'm just living my life. I'm, you know, and, and, you know, you shouldn't be judging me. You shouldn't be adding rules. I'm not about your rules based Christianity. Yeah. And, um, but and that's fine for them to say that, but then they have to ask themselves, are the things that I'm doing exhibiting a love for God mm-hmm. and a love for others? Or is it simply me just me doing me, mm-hmm. me living my truth and mm-hmm. which are which is not necessarily um leading the you truth. in a life that yeah, leading <laughs> you in a life that honors and right. pleases God. Which of course brings up the question of why the heck are there rules in the first place? And the the question that jay kind of just pointed out is like if if we're saved by faith and by grace and not by works are we allowed to sin then and paul's right. <laughs> answer to this throughout Ro- the book of romans is by no means may it never be may it never be that we <laughs> sin and he talks about a whole different a bunch of different reasons why that's mm-hmm. so and it, mm-hmm. it involves walking in the spirit and not in the flesh but um again one of the examples that we see of why there are rules is to promote unity and the importance of that in the early church and the importance uh, how much emphasis we should put that on that in the modern church. So we see that the, the rules they put, uh, things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, and things that have been uh, bled out non-kosher wise. Right. Uh, two of those are Jewish rules that Christians don't even uh, do nowadays. So what's right. the point of them? And it's because, look, these Jews were getting uncomfortable with people eating food that was sacrificed to idols or doing right. certain things. And it would cause problems. It would cause fights and, and disagreements. And what James is saying essentially is put that aside, you know, just don't do it for the sake of your brother. And a, one another thing that Paul says is, or if anything causes your brother to stumble, that's not yeah. Paul, that's Jesus. That is, that's, no, Paul? that's Paul okay. in Romans 14. If anything causes another person to stumble, you know, put it aside. So yeah. it's just put other people before yourself if it's going to cause problems with them. Yep. And then obviously the, the sexual immorality one still applies and that just has to do with uh, the idea of holiness and, and living rightly as opposed yep. to. But yeah, the the importance of laws is not specifically because that's what's going to make you righteous, but that is the right way to live with each other and right. with God. Yeah. Steph. You can ask the question. <laughs> I'm just making sure no one else is going to add anything. How does this story lead to the fulfilling of the story of God throughout the rest yeah, of the Bible? Absolutely. I think it really points to, I well, this is what I took from it anyway, is the council specifically is just, as I learn more about Christian history, it's like, this is how Christians decided what was right to believe and, and using the wisdom of the large church and the body of Christ uh, together with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that they've been given. That is how we get the truth of the gospel. And it's right. not through, oh, this is what's going to fit us. It's this is what God has said in his word, and this is how we need to apply it. And I think just seeing the first council appear yeah. is, is really cool. Yeah, and I think along those lines, it highlights the importance of community. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, yeah, because without community, then maybe you have... James saying, okay, everyone has to be circumcised. And then you have Paul saying, nobody needs to be circumcised. And and then you have these two other schools of thought and they're going in different directions. But then what happens if there's a disagreement between James and somebody else? And then you have another mm-hmm. split and then another split with Paul. And How are you else. one body if it's... How do you become yeah, exactly. one unified body? And so we need community. And, and we see in uh, the Galatians account where because of community... Paul was able to pull Peter aside mm-hmm. in the community, in front of the community, and say, "Listen, why are you doing? Why are you living this way? Mm-hmm. This doesn't honor God." And that might make some of us uncomfortable to say, "Well, I don't want that from community," uh, but it's for the it's for our own good, and it's for the good of the community that we are reminded of the way that we are living, the way that we are called to live, and the way that we may or may not be aligning ourselves with that. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just see here, yeah, uh, a real importance on community. Absolutely. 
Yeah. I think my, my answer fits right into the community as well because yeah. that's exactly yeah. uh, how that works. Yeah. What do you think, Abby? Was that a sufficient answer? I think that was sufficient. I give you guys a B plus. Oh. Oh. Best grade I've ever gotten. No, I'm just <laughs> All righty. Thanks for listening. I hope to see you next week. See you later. Bye for now. <laughs> B plus.